should say at the top, Israel, God's children. Now, we're not going to be looking too much in the book of Joshua. I'm going to continue on where we left off last week. Um, as I was closing Joshua uh, 13 from last week and then shaping out the distribution of the land, um, again, I felt that God was pressing on my heart to hit pause on this and to really understand what's going on. And uh, so I want to, th this message is the result of hitting pause and prayerfully navigating what God was pressing in on my heart. And I pray that it speaks to us all on some level, in some way, some shape, um, because we're all parents or we've all have parental influence in someone else's life. And we're all children. We've all had parents. And through Christ, we're all God's children. And so I, I, I feel that this has, uh, we all have a place to receive something at the table this morning. In Joshua chapter 13, just to recap where I'm coming from, Joshua 13, 1. Um, now Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, you're old and advanced in years, and there remains very much land to possess. And he continues to go on, and he says, now therefore divide this land for inheritance to the nine uh, tribes and, and half the tribe of Manasseh. So what's happening here, the national campaign is coming, it's done, it's over. Joshua, who's commanding presence, voice, and illustration of how he lived, was no longer going to be the driving force for the nation to follow. They were going to take the faith that has been nurtured, the faith that compelled them to grow up with less and less of God being directly, supernaturally involved in the battles to ultimately them, the people, the children, going and driving out the giants in the land that caused their parents to fear and rebel against God. These are our people who have matured. But now, it's time to take the faith home. It's time to engage our families. And Joshua, who has served as a commander, also has a family. He also has an inheritance, and he as well is going to go home and nurture that which God's given him in faith. And see, that, that splitting up and, and taking faith home, respectively by tribe, is, is looking at it from Joshua's perspective, had to be a very weighty thing. Just like a parent who sees their children and knows all the craziness that this world has and is. And we have fear, will my child make the right choices? Will my child's life turn out to be okay? Will everything be okay? And as God is loosening our grip on that parental involvement to be less and less as a child grows and grows, we tend to feel that. And as we go through the rest of Joshua, we're gonna find Joshua not getting involved, standing back and encouraging them to take their faith and make it their own. And this is a hard thing for a lot of us to do. I mean, my children are still very young, but yet there's, it, there's still levels of it that, that touch and, 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 and weigh heavy on my heart. But for the people of Israel, they had to understand that God is their father, not Joshua. God is their father, and they needed to have a faith with him that would grow <coughs> and that they would walk in him with. They had to make their faith their own. And I think to help understand this, they come back all the way to the beginning. And I'm going to, again, this is in your bulletin. There's a lot of scripture today because we're looking at a topical idea, a picture, not a command of God from what parenting looks like, but we're going to look at the example of God on what parenting looks like, what nurturing looks like. And I want to begin with Genesis chapter 26 with Abraham's son. Isaac, you'll remember, was a son born very late in Abraham's life. And Abraham had a pretty divided house at times. And Isaac, his son, uh, is no exception. His house has followed in that tradition. Jacob and Esau are born, his children, and they're already wrestling for superiority and rights. But in this context, in Genesis chapter 26, there's a verse I want us to hear. And it says, now there was a famine in the land, 
besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. So this is different, but still the stage is being set very similar. And so Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and the Lord appeared to him. The Lord appeared to who? Isaac. He appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but dwell in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you. I will bless you, for to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. So we see Isaac has left. Abraham is no longer a part of the journey, and God is stepping into and speaking to Isaac the way that he spoke to his father, affirming to Isaac that Isaac is as much a part of a plan and purpose that God the father is writing the same as his dad Abraham was. And in this, I will multiply your offspring, the stars of heaven, and give to your offspring all the lands, and your offspring, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed. But listen to this. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. What God is affirming to Isaac is that it wasn't Abraham's faithfulness that earned him God's love, but it was Abraham's trust and obedience to God that allowed God to bring blessing into the relationship. That as Abraham experienced blessing in his walk with God, those became seeds planted through behavior and teaching into Isaac. And those seeds in, his, in Abraham's son's life, God wants a harvest from. And see, when we're investing in people's lives, it's not just our teaching, but it's our example. And we put those seeds, God is jealous to bring harvest from those seeds. Abraham planted them into Isaac. Now that Abraham is gone, God is as involved with Isaac as he was with Abraham. And we need to remember that the nation of Israel going in to conquer the land went all the way back to the faithfulness of the forefathers. Abraham and Isaac. So Isaac repeated the example of his dad. Yes, he had a divided house. Yes, there was sibling rivalry. Yet the faith of his dad was an investment in his life that God wanted to harvest from. Now the next section, I'm going to jump ahead to the future here a little bit. Next it is chapter 19. And this is just helping us remember as the children of Israel are about to receive their inheritance, they are not given a pen to write their own future, but they're being invited to continue and impart participation with what God is doing to make them a nation that blesses all the world. God is inviting them to trust and to obey, just like Abraham and just like Isaac. In Exodus chapter 19 now, verses 1 through 6, it says, Now on the, on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain of God, the mountain of the Lord. And while Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So as God delivered the descendants of Abraham from Egypt before going into the land of promise, he's reminding them that they're saved with a purpose. That their walk with God was to be something that became a blessed invitation for the world around them to see what walking with God looks like. That's what they're involved to participate in. But the quality of that relationship would depend on their trust and their obedience to God. And that's played out over and over and over. One more passage uh, before we jump into the heart of this. Just, again, background. It's like looking at a stage. The curtain's closed, and you hear rumbling as pieces are being moved around to pull the curtain to begin the story. This comes from Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at a few verses here. But, but we saw the fruit of, of, of a life. When Abraham was faithful to God, that fruit became investment into 
Isaac, his son, and God desired to see a harvest from that. And we looked at Exodus. God has, had, God has brought as wings of eagles his people from Egypt, and he's inviting them to enjoy quality in the relationship and the purpose that God is working through them as a nation delivered and to occupy the land. But now what is the purpose of it, the purpose of life? In Deuteronomy chapter 7, Verse 1, it says, Now when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hivites, the uh, Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them, yet you shall not intermarry with them giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. And what God wants them to understand, what he's saying in this is that if we as parents, if we as a present generation are not going to trust and obey God, we're setting up the next generation for a failure, is what he's saying. Amen. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars, dash in pieces their pillars, chop down their ashram, and burn their carved images with fire. What's all that stuff? Their worship of false gods. Their living life in the manner that was right in their own eyes. Get rid of that stuff. God's showing them that they need to drive out what is contrary to God. Now let's look at, at, at more of what God is saying here. We're going to drive them out. We're going to continue to trust you. But what is this going to look like for us? Verse 6 continues. You are, a, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. You are set apart. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the people on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And we know this story because we are, again, chiefs of sinners, and we are saved. We are pulled out of the mire of sin that we once walked, wallowed, and did life in. It's the same thing. He says, now, therefore, know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who, who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Now, again, God is very much concerned with the next generation and the generation following and following and following. And the impact that allows them to be resourced to know the goodness of God is by how the present generation knows and loves, trusts and obeys. They had to receive God's love. God's love drives out our fear and allows us to keep our hands in his even when we don't see, understand, and we trust. But we have to walk soberly. We need to be watchful of our lives as Deuteronomy is going to close here. Listen to these words. Yes, God is, is faithful to show his love and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, but he is also the same God who repays to the, their faces those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. And we looked at that, the great white throne judgment, last week. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandments and the statutes and the rules that I command you to do. And you, because you listen to these rules and keep and do them, the God, your Lord, your God, will keep you and keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that he swore to your fathers. God's purpose with Israel would not be removed, but the quality of the relationship that they would enjoy with God and the quality that their children would be set up to enjoy with God had everything to do with how they chose to trust and obey him today. Now, all of that is the history of Israel now standing under the leadership of Joshua, who's receiving word from God that it's time to empower them to go home and take their faith home. That's their heritage. They're at, right now, the strongest 
that the nation of Israel as a collected nation have ever been in trusting and obeying God. They are poised for excellence. But as we're going to continue to go through Joshua, we're going to see failure. What we're not going to see is Joshua stepping in to fix it. We have this tendency when we see people making choices, as Joshua will see the people of Israel that lead them away from God, we do one of two extremes. And the first one is we tend to go all the way over here. Where did I go wrong? Did I not love well enough? Did I not teach well enough? Did I not do enough? And we just constantly second guess and berate ourselves. And I just wonder sometimes what the conversation within the Trinity would have been like when Adam and Eve chose to sin. Was there that sense of, where did we go wrong? And so that another time, but just, just think about this. Because being all the way over here to where we're so guilt-ridden, it eats us up. Or we come all the way to this side to where we're completely, you know what? You made your own choices. Go and die over there where I don't have to see it. Go and suffer where I don't have to see it. I'm choosing and I chose. I taught you this, you said no. I showed you this, you said no. And we become so hard-hearted that we just hit the switch to turn off any love, emotion, or connection. And we just allow them to be dead to us. That's the other extreme. But I want to argue and present that there's a middle that wavers a little bit back and forth. Sometimes we need to always be looking at how are we representing Jesus? And at the same time, we need to come over a little bit over here and recognize that the problem, even in our best effort to illustrate Jesus, does not become Jesus for the person who is a sinner in need of a savior. And so to keep us at a healthy place, I think these examples in scripture are good for us to always keep our hearts and our walk with God calibrated. And so what I'm presenting to you next is topical. I usually don't go in this direction because I'm very cautious about not making the Bible say what I want. Expository preaching keeps us in the framework of, of allowing the text to say what it is. But in these examples, I'm looking at what Jesus did more so than what he said. And so I want to invite you to, 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 to watch with me and allow the Spirit to speak in your heart. The first one, I'm uh, just going to turn to Hebrews chapter 7. I'm going to have some participation here in a minute, so make sure that we're all paying attention. Pop quiz. You get it wrong, you don't eat. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 7. I'm going to be looking at, uh, I'm starting with verse 22. This makes Jesus... I mean, do, do any of us struggle, or am I by myself? Do you ever struggle? <laughs> B. Do you ever think that you can make the difference in someone's life? No. Do we ever feel like we need to be Jesus to the point that we replace Jesus in someone's life? Now, we say we don't think that, but does our behavior fall in line with that? Sometimes. Very good. Because I think if we're honest, there are times I forget and I, I try to be Jesus. And I'm not. The former priests, the examples of the sacrificial system, they were prevented by death from continuing in the office. So priest after priest would come. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. He's at the right hand of the Father, ascended, raised, a sacrifice that was accepted. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. Jesus is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Is that qualification that any of us have ever met? No. He has no need, like those priests, to offer sacrifices daily. First for his own sin, and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself on the cross. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priest. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. So I want to invite you with me. 
I am not Jesus. I want to invite you to say that with me. I am not Jesus. And we need to remind ourselves of that. We're called to be like him. We're being conformed into him, but we are not Jesus. I do not have the power to save anyone, neither do you. I have not the power to bring anyone home, neither do you. I have not the power to awaken an understanding of anything in someone's life, neither do you. And that's liberating. But it's also weighty because we do and we are invited to participate. And that's the participation I want to look at. And that's what we're going to see Joshua start to do now as the leader, as the father figure in the people of Israel's lives. Luke chapter 15. This is a story we all know. Again, a lot of scripture. Don't feel the need to turn there. If you want to listen, listen. These are stories that, that we know. And I just, again, I'm not teaching them because I don't think these parables that Jesus is giving were meant to be dissected on a, on a table looking at uh, at great theological heights. I think they were stories that simply drove home a point. And, and this is the, the standing off observation. If I was someone in the crowd of Jesus teaching this, what it would have told me, what it would have said to me in the circumstances that I'm in right now. So listen to this. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. Like the people of Israel about to receive their inheritance. And he divided his property between them. Now, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Now, observation. Did the father plead with the son at any point in time? Possibly, probably. Did the father go after the son? No. no. Let that sink in. On the left of your bulletin, I put two terms, and we visited these, but I think it's important that we understand healthy balance. Apostasy, we looked at this through Hebrews, is when we pull our hand out of God's and we're not trusting and obeying. Doing that consistently, it starts to define us. The danger is that the hardening of our hearts is a continual walk refusing God. And we looked at Romans 1, and there comes a point where God stops. He lets you go, but then there's a point that he stops. Are you saying we lose our salvation? No, I'm just saying that in the Bible, this is what apostasy means. This is what hard-hearted means. And in this story here, the father lets the son go. That is hard to do. Many of us have circumstances that can on some level connect to that. God's inviting us to feel the weight on his heart. But yet what Let's continue reading. I just observation, the father did not go after the son. <clears throat> now, when the son had spent everything, severe famine. There's that famine again. It's almost like God brings us to places of starvation to get our attention. Like it's easy to be confident that we're doing everything right, but when you end up sleeping in a car and having no money for food, you stop to think about my choices in life, right? And I say that because I had been there. I've slept in my car. I've not had money for food in my younger days. And it's funny because I can remember when I got my first full-time job, I was making more money than I knew what to do with. It was insane. Very good at managing. And I'm thinking to myself now, man, what a fool. I wish I could go back and just shake my former self and say, put the money away. You have kids in the future that will greatly benefit from this. <laughs> But no, I didn't. And what I did with my money was I bought the things I never had growing up on a farm. I bought Nike shoes. I bought designer jeans. I bought things that I never had. Nintendo um, 64 was coming out to date myself. And uh, I went and I bought every game for probably a few months as it was released. And never even played most of them. But it was just the idea of having them because I never had it as a child. And I felt that I needed to go on this vendetta to have the things I didn't have growing up. But thankfully, something happened. It left me empty. And as I'm turning that stuff in to get cash back, I was getting pennies for what it was that I paid and dished out. Shoes, where am I gonna wear them? To work? I got them all worn out from just walking in the grocery stores and, and, and going into the meat floors and things like that. And it's like, what, why am I doing this? So this young man, and maybe we can all relate to that, right? We've had moments that we wake up to realize that. Now this young man, has famine, and he rose in his country and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? So now something's starting to click in his mind. What would the father have done had he been a part of the son's life and saw this happening? And, I, and, I, and again, I'm going to jump to scriptures, but all scripture, if you read scripture enough, these stories start to connect. I think of David, who, despite everything, loved Saul so much that if God would not have separated David from Saul, David would have drawn a sword and fought the Philistines that were meant to be a judgment from God. Sometimes God has to separate the person from us so that he can be God in their life. And we have to be okay with that. We have to trust on a new level that even if our child, even if someone is going to find themselves fighting pigs for food, because had something intervened, that verse, when he came to himself, may not have happened. But because he did come to himself, he has eternal celebration. I want to continue this. Again, observations, just not, not anything profound. Stuff that you probably think about when you're reading it too. But he thought to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father's house and say to him, I have sinned against heaven and, and, uh, against heaven and before you. Now I'm starting to be repentant. Confession. Hold on to that. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Humility. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Submission. Whatever your judgment. And he arose and came to his father's house. And it's almost like you hear the Gibeonites in there, right? A little bit in the sense that, well, we'll just be hired servants in your house. It's better to eat the bread that falls on floors than to be six feet under and not have a future with my children in the land, etc. And the son returns, and he rose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, which means even though his father didn't go after him, he was what? Watching for him, praying for him, trusting that the ultimate father knows how to bring his children home. He waited and watched, and he saw. And the father ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the father said to him, or the son said to him, Father, as he's being kissed, as he's being embraced, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He had this whole thing rehearsed, and he's trying to get it out while his father is holding him and kissing him. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. When a tongue confesses Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. The old has passed away. The old, all things have become new. New clothes. We are sealed so much. And the fattened calf, kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the older son was in the field. And he came. He hears all this. And he drew near to the house. And he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. So now observation, the older son who stayed and served faithfully is now angry that the son who squandered left and brought so much pain and misery is now being celebrated. The father goes after him. Do we see this? The father goes out to find this son and have a conversation. He was angry and refused to go, and the father came out. And he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me the young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, and killed the fat, you've killed the fat calf for him. 
And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Final observation on this, recapping. The one son who wants to squander and go away, the father lets go. Another son stays, and the father continues to do life with the son. The son that stayed has a purpose, just as the son who left. The son who left will not be the story that the son, uh, that the son who stayed would have, any more than he, the one that would leave. Both sons have a place. The father had to recognize that his role was to invest in the son that was there. The one who left, he had to let God deal with. And that's hard. And that's hard for pastors, elders, deacons, believers, brothers and sisters, and parents to do that. Because we're so prone to be thinking about, worrying about, and wondering about those who have walked off that we neglect those who have stayed. We want so much that we neglect what's here. This continues. Now, again, these are just observations. Maybe I'm a fool being silly and I've over, overstepped or bitten off too much. Mark is the next one that the Spirit took me to thinking on this. Mark chapter 5. Now, this is a story of Jesus again. But this time, it's not a story he's telling. It's one he's living. They came to the other side of the sea, in the country of the uh, Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now this man lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with chains and shackles, but he wrenched the chains apart. And I always think of the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Don't make me angry, and the chains and the shackles are busting off. And he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. And I'm thinking... I wonder if they tried to hire people to go in, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks if you go try to put the shackle on that guy over there and then stand back. Like who, how did you get to a point to where no one could subdue him? Like how many people tried before you just stopped and gave up? Now, night and day among the tombs on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. You can't ignore this problem. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Observation. They're not discrediting Jesus for being who he is. Jesus doesn't even need to introduce himself. They know who he is. And I say they, for he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He was the host of something much bigger than himself. And now listen to this, because there's two places in this that people are going to beg Jesus to do something. Now this man, with the legion, these demons inside of him, they beg him earnestly. Who, Jesus, not to send them out of the country? Now a great herd of pigs were feeding on the hillside, and they begged him, again, begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. And then what does Jesus do? Gives them permission. He gives them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and the country, and the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there. But this time, he's clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. The best of their efforts could not even bring this man in submission, and now he's sitting next to Jesus. The one who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and they, what? Began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. And as he was getting into the boat, as he was getting in the boat, Jesus listened. Observation. The demons asked Jesus for something, and he gave it. 
the town asks Jesus to leave. And he turns and gets in the boat. They were driven by fear. But as he was getting in the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with them. He begged Jesus. You get a lot of begging here. And for the first time in the story, Jesus says no. And he says no to his child. This man is his child now. He's been released. He's become a part of what Jesus is doing now. He begged him, Lord, let me go with you. He did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Kind of like a testify time, just at home. And he went away and began to proclaim who the man healed, how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. I am not Jesus. I am not Jesus. I am not Jesus. If Jesus himself was not able to connect directly with the people of that community, but sent somebody that had been healed from that community back into it, we need to be at a place to where we're okay if God chooses to use somebody else. Jesus was okay. He trusted the Father. He wasn't on a personal fame roller coaster. Demons asked him, he said, okay. The people asked him, he turns to get in the boat. But his son, the child that's healed, that comes to him and says, my Lord, let me go with you. He says, no. You're a part of something. Go and tell everyone what you've received, what you've seen, what you've experienced. We may not be what God uses to reach our children, but we need to trust God that he will reach them. Jesus wasn't in his person what that town needed in order to receive him, so he sent them what they did need, and we need to be okay with that. Joshua would not be what the people needed anymore. God would start sending judges, prophets. He will always send what is needed. Be okay with the fact of it not being you every time. Be okay with that. It continues. One more story here. Mar uh, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. Oh, we love that part. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. How does God send out laborers into the harvest? Prayer. Prayer. But he also, where do we come to get trained and equipped to do the work of gospel ministry? Church. The families. We looked at the son who left versus the son who stayed. The father continued with the son who stayed. Why? Because that son who stayed is a laborer. We have a tendency to be drawn towards the problematic children, the problematic people, the problematic circumstances to the point that they absorb so much of our attention that we're neglecting what is in front of us. And I know this and I see this in counseling and in books that I read and testimonies and it weighs heavy on my heart and I'm even seeing it with my own children. Do I focus too much on the ones that demand so much attention at the neglect of what's in front of me? See, my, my job as a dad is to train my children to be laborers for the kingdom. Not to, not to amount great things, a great name, great stuff, but to love Jesus so much that they are championing forward as a laborer for him. That's my job. Nothing else. It embodies so much more than that. And again, there's so much, you're probably thinking, well, this scripture says this, this one says that. Again, just general panoramic because Joshua is stepping out and we see him and we see God growing the people up. And it's not easy. It's not easy to watch children walk away. It's not easy to focus on those that are still present in front of us when those that demand so much attention, so many problems are crying out 
But if Jesus did it, so must we. Invest in what's in front of you is where that, where that ends. So we see, we saw our father's purpose with the nation of Israel. We know that God has saved them with a purpose, but then we also see how God invests himself in his people. We see a parent recognizes that Jesus is the only answer their children will ever need. We see a parent lets their child walk away trusting God. We see a parent recognizes they may not be what God uses to reach their children, and they still trust God. And we see a parent will invest in all children, not just the walkers. And I don't want to say problems, and I don't want to say misfits or black sheep, walkers. People who just constantly walk away. Or come back, get what they want, then walk away. Come back, get what they want, walk away. That's what's embodied in that. Choose wisely who you invest in. Do not neglect those who are in front of you, even on the home front. But how do we do this? How do we keep our eyes when it's so hard on the person in front of us versus those who walk away or live contrary? What did God have his attention on? And I believe it was always the kingdom. I think Jesus, when he walked, it was always about the kingdom. And I think for Joshua, it was always about the kingdom. Three more scriptures we're going to look at. You know, you're thinking, oh, pastor, come on now. Again, I don't do this too often, but just, uh, this, this rocked my world. And I, and I just want to invite you to experience it. Because we need to have sober minds eyes, expectations, that we are going to be investing in people, including our own children, that may walk away from God. What is, what is the cost of having Jesus at the center of our lives? What is the cost having God's kingdom, the center of our eyes, where our life walks, the direction, our behaviors, everything is moving towards? This is what it looks like. Jesus is saying, now I have come to cast fire on the earth. That doesn't sound very loving. And would that it were already kindled. Wow. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No. I tell you, but rather I've come to give division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter, daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Notice it doesn't say father-in-law. Just kidding. But the issue here is that following Jesus at the center of our walk, the direct impact is our immediate family. And not everybody's going to love Jesus. Not everybody's going to love how in love we are with Jesus. And we need to be okay with that, understanding that. And trusting that the best thing that we could ever do for the people that we love is to continue to know and love and to surrender more and more and trust and obedience to Jesus. And another passage now, I, I want to keep this moving. Just observations now. Again, Jesus said this. In fact, it's going to get so crazy that our brother will deliver another brother over to death. Talk about having sibling rivalry. How many of you have a family member that would wish you dead? And the father of his child and the children will rise against their parents to have them put to death. Why? Because of Jesus. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Think about that. Allow what you, either Jesus has lost his mind, or he's exaggerating, or he's letting us know the cost of what it means to follow him. The cost of what it means to be kingdom focused. It's not always going to be happily ever after every moment of every day. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Keeping our eye focused on the Father, 
his kingdom will bring division. It can bring rejection. But another passage that really struck me, because I hear these words and I have a tendency to overcome, say, well, I don't want my child to grow up and hate the Lord. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to over this and I'm going to over that. And we tend to overwhelm. The same thing with people in a church, in our small group, in our context, we tend to overwhelm to be Jesus to where we're no longer helping, but we're enabling. And that's a very fine line that we have to understand, nevertheless, that there is a line between helping and enabling. And it made it look different for each of us. The story that, that just popped the spirit, uh, Damien, you're missing it. Damien, you're missing it. Damien, you're missing it. Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. 10 virgins, 10 people waiting, excited to see Jesus. It's bridegroom. Five of them, though, were foolish, and five were wise. Now when the foolish took their lamps, it took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. Now the bridegroom was delayed, and they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him! Those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. <laughs> And while they were going out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the, poor, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open us. But he said, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, looking at this from a parental perspective, you have ten virgins here. You have five that are prepared, and you have five that just showed up without anything. And I think we see the difference of helping versus enabling. The ones who came prepared have been taught to live life with preparation, to take care of their needs, to take care of themselves, to make decisions that enable them to have what they need in the moment that they will need it. Those who show up with nothing are the ones that come from families to where it doesn't matter. It, it, I don't need to do that. Somebody else will do it for me. That's enabling. And a funny story, but it's true. I, I mean, I have, we have kids at home, and, and when we have foster children come in, we eat at the dinner table, put the dishes in the sink. My children will leave it just sitting on the counter, or, on, or leave it on the, the, they're not eating at the table, and they're eating at, dining room, or at the uh, coffee table, and just leave it sit there. Or they'll open up a wrapper and drop it on the floor. They do it here at church. And it's something simple. And, 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 I'll, and I'll say this, and I'll say, well, you, you need to reach down and pick that up. No, Daddy. Or I will, Daddy. And then they don't. Or someone else just, oh, it's their child. Let me grab that for them. No. You've just enabled them. Something simple becomes something more. And they're going to grow up to become people that say, well, somebody will always run to my rescue. Somebody else will always take care of the problem. I don't need to worry about it. That's enabling. God is not resourcing us to enable sinners to be sinners. He's enabling us to lead sinners to Jesus. He's empowering us to lead sinners to Jesus. He's walking with us to help people come to Jesus. We need to understand that. We need to be okay with that. And we need to be at peace saying no and not enabling. And again, maybe I'm the only one wrestling with this. But I, I just, I, I read through Joshua probably three or four times last week alone. And I'm seeing, and I'm just trying to feel what would Joshua have felt watching the people who accomplished so much and were the healthiest that they ever would have been go and drift the way that they did. Being okay settling for less. Being okay disregarding. And what it would mean for Joshua not to run to the rescue, but to trust God to be God in their lives. So we saw our Father's purpose. We're going to recap and close this. Again, I apologize. This is an out-of-the-ordinary sermon for me, but this has been an out-of-the-ordinary week for me in my own heart walk with God. Our Father's purpose. God chose Israel to be a blessing to all the world. And the quality of that would be based on their individual trust and obedience. It is never anything different. 
He began with Abraham. Abraham passed that on as seeds through his word and example to his children and to their children. And God, every generation, wanted a harvest. He's jealous for a harvest, the scripture would say, of the seeds of faith that have been planted through word and example in the lives of the children. Coming to bring them to be a nation that all the world would see what it means to walk in harmony with the true and living God. We see God as a father investing in us. We recognize that we're not Jesus. Joshua recognized he's not God. God confirmed, I will continue to go with the people. You're old, you're advanced in years. I will continue to be God. I will continue to drive out these people. We are not Jesus. Jesus will continue to be Jesus, and we need to be okay with that. We see a child who walks away versus one who stays. Our job, pray, love, intercede, but invest in the one who stays. A parent recognizes they may not be what God uses. The one who walks or the one that wanders, it may not be us, but God is still their God. What has been invested in them, he is jealous for it and will pursue it to get a harvest. He'll bring people in their lives. Be okay with that. Be okay with it not being you. And then we see a father's focus. To be so kingdom focused on Jesus in our lives will impact our families and it may bring division, it may bring rejection. It's okay for you, mom and dad, but that's not what I want for my life. And we have to be careful that we're not enabling sinners to be sinners, but we're helping sinners find Jesus. And then finally, how do we do that? How do we do that? And I wrestled with so many passages of scripture and finally I was like, God, I'm gonna start getting lots if you don't answer and just go back to the old lottery system. But this passage in James came to me and I wanna close with it. And as a, our uh, worship team comes forward, cap this off by noon, it smells so good, that food. <laughs> James chapter five, listen to these words. Again, these are words that we know, but I want us to observe, just simply observe. James chapter five, how can we invest in a healthy way in the people that are in front of us? How can we love with letting go those who walk away from us? What is the center of it? Yes, it's Jesus, but what does that look like? James writes, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with him, him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith, uh, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. If demons can ask something from Jesus and he listens and gives it to them, why don't we pray? If a, group, a town can ask Jesus to leave and he does, and we're hesitant to pray, we're his children. It says the prayer of a righteous, we have the righteousness of Christ has great power and it's working. Why are we praying? Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently, not once, not twice, not when it was convenient, not on Sundays, not when my neighbor's watching, fervently that it might not rain. And for three years, six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruits. Again, there's that famine contrast, right? Think about that. Hold on to that. Famine is going to be repeated throughout the book of Joshua. I'm just dropping that little seed there. We're going to have a harvest on it. Trust me. Now, but listen to this. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Now, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. All I want us to see in this passage is a simple observation. How can we invest well by being present in their lives? Are you the one that someone calls to pray with them? 
Are you the one that someone will confess sin to and struggles to? Are you someone that God can use to go up to somebody in, in a store? It's about being involved, hearing the Spirit's voice, and being willing to participate in any way God chooses, and being willing to let go. For he says, I've got this. Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father our God, as we come before you, I thank you so much that you're God, that you're our Father. Lord, parenting is hard, pastoring is hard, being a brother in Christ is hard. Following Jesus is hard. Picking up my cross, Lord, is hard. And there are moments where the weight of it is felt. But you're not inviting any of us to be you. You're inviting us to know your love and to be filled with it so much that we're willing, we're willing to be like you. We're willing to be follow, to follow you. We're willing to love as you have loved us. We're willing to speak as you speak to us. We're willing to be all that you are to us when you call us to participate, Father. May we all be found to say yes to you. May we be okay, Father, in the moments where someone walks away. May we be okay focusing on the person who stays, who is in front of us. May we be so hungry, Father, to see those who you have brought in our life become laborers for the harvest. A harvest that you are desiring in the people whose seeds of truth have been planted into. Father, no one else could write this story better than you. No one else can write a story to where a son could wander and then bring, be brought back home. Only you can do that. And Father, I celebrate that that's my God, that you are my God, and that's who you are. So, Father, I surrender to you. May I love as a father as you call me to love. May I love as a husband as you call me to love. May I love as a pastor as you call me to love. May I love as a friend and as a brother in Christ as you call me to love. I pray and I surrender to you.